I'm going to talk to you all today about how we can bring chaos engineering into the domains of application and cloud security. Um, as Casey uh, mentioned and uh, before that I'm a director of engineering at Sneak um, and I look after the infrastructure group, which is SRE, uh, cloud platforms and the implementation of cloud security there as well. So I want to start with why, like why does this bringing security into, into the mix matter um, with, uh, with chaos engineering? Uh, so I just pulled out a statistic here. There was a report done by IBM around um, incidents that have happened over the last couple of years. They took uh, about 524 different cases. Um, and this was one of the most interesting statistics that I found from it, which was like while data breaches from attackers outside the organization happen in about 52% of cases, the remaining 48% comes from accidents and mistakes within the organization. This isn't like a statement of blame or anything, but I think we can probably all identify with this, that um, we're kind of turning security and compliance on its head in more recent years and trying to rethink what it means as we build kind of more complex, distributed, kind of social, technical systems um, where domain boundaries are not often very well defined. It's very easy for us to, to make accidents and mistakes around configuration and, and other types of things like that. The other thing that I've got here is the solar winds picture. Um, some of you, if you're from or interested in security, will probably remember very recently there was a very high profile security breach for, for solar winds. Um, it was actually a double breach. Um, so there's a, a recent article that came out. Um, so there was a, both a Russian sort of attack and a Chinese attack on solar winds um, and basically thousands of government, uh, government employees, uh, personally identifiable information got um, compromised and also 18,000 of their customers as well. So it's, it's a really big deal, um, it can cost your company uh, millions uh, of dollars every time there's a breach, about $4 million. Um, another key reason why I wanted to talk about this is that I've talked about chaos engineering a lot over the last four years or so. But when I came to do this talk, there isn't a huge amount of, of content around security and compliance as applied to chaos engineering. There's a handful of people that talk about it a lot, but other than that, there, there isn't a huge amount out there. So I thought it would be interesting. Also, just to say the company that I work for is a DevSec company. So we specifically build tools um, and platforms for developers around security tooling to bring that into the early into the um, software development lifecycle. So just, uh, so I'm just gonna move this out of the way. So I think like a key thing to mention here is like, when you think about it, we're, we're adopting a lot of open source technologies and in, into, our, into our stack, into our ecosystems in the things that we build internally. Um, over the last 10 years, this is much more popularized. Um, you can see the rise of this all the time. I know where I've worked over the last six to 10 years, we use a huge amount of open source technologies. Um, this is just a kind of a, a medley of the kind of example of the kind of technologies you might have today running in, in, in your company. And basically, I'm just saying we're, we're basically constructing ecosystems of other people's software. And with that comes risk um, around vulnerabilities um, being uh, there and being exploitable. Um, and it's something that we need to bear in mind. And I think even in more highly regulated environments like banks, uh, Harpreet might identify with this, that while that was you know, not often the case five, 10 years ago, there is more of an adoption there. And I'm seeing more of these highly regulated environments actually adopting cloud native technologies as well. Um, another key thing is around the opaqueness of ownership. So when a company starts out, there's usually like a handful of engineers, um, the footprint of the technology is super small. People can hold the whole architecture of the system in their heads. And people are very adaptable to work across all sorts of the stack and domain as and when needed. But of course, as a company grows, um, that becomes not the case. And here is just kind of a high level illustration of like a service, a kind of a service map and kind of domain boundaries as sort of put here with the dotted lines. So you might have different teams or groups owning these different services. And as we see in a lot of the kind of journey to microservices or service oriented architectures, there's often still kind of a monolithic application that lives in the middle 
And to be honest, a lot of companies never actually get past that point, um, which can be, you know, create a single point of failure uh, in our systems. Um, and at this point of scale, the architecture just doesn't fit in any one person's head anymore. Um, and that kind of allows uh, for, you know, when we think back to that 48% of um, security vulnerabilities um, and mistakes come from within the company, it's, it's, it's not really so ridiculous to see that. And I just want to, kind of illustrate the actual messy reality of it as well. Like that looks really neat and tidy. I think to have like really strong ownership, really well documented and understood domain boundaries is kind of like the best case scenario. But I think in a lot of companies that's actually not true. Um, I know that from experience <laughs> because also as a company grows, things shift, right? People, you know, create new groups. Um, there's uh, reorganizations, and with that, there's often a lot of confusion about handover and who, who what scope people own um, and what they're responsible for. And here you can see there's lots of um, data flows and communication between our different services, um, which you know opens opens the scope really for like vagueness and who owns what. And oh, I thought so and so was doing that. No, it's actually this team. And so you can easily see where security and compliance risk really starts to come into the picture. So this was a, oops, sorry about that. So this was a quote that I really liked. Um, so threats to safety usually result from a lack of integration across levels of a complex socio-technical system. It's not usually just deficiencies at any one level. So again, I think part of the thing around chaos engineering and bringing security and compliance into the mix is trying to build those bridges, that kind of integration that we don't, sometimes see in organizations into other parts of the organization, such as if you have an information security and risk um, department, application security teams, legal teams, I work with them quite heavily now, um, product development teams. I mean, there's the scope for, for a lot of different parts of the organization to, to kind of build this integration. I've got two more models and then we'll, we'll kind of jump into like, how do, how, like, what are we actually doing with chaos uh, security, chaos engineering? So this is one of my favorites and I use this in a lot of my talks, um, but it's just one that I want to pull out, which is Rasmussen's normalization of deviance model. And again, just something to think about, um, like why does it matter and kind of why do we need to, to focus on these uh, kind of chaos experiments and kind of build that into our culture? is th this model kind of neatly describes like we have an economic failure boundary. Um, we also have an unacceptable workload boundary and the economic failure boundary. If we cross that boundary in our organization, <clears throat> we're basically sunk. The company's bankrupt. So there's always pressure away from that, obviously. And then we have an unacceptable workload boundary, which is what are human humans as adaptable as we are, are very and systems. There's only a finite amount of capacity. And so there will always be a pressure and it's kind of like there's kind of this dot here that's kind of like you are here. So it's kind of, the two things combine the management pressure towards the efficiency, trying to get more uh, sort of economic um, value uh, with less and the gradient towards least effort. So trying to finish the task in the least amount of effort possible because there's always more work than we can actually do. That, that causes production pressure. And then there's this accident boundary and this is the really important thing. So this is when you might have a data breach, for instance. And the interesting thing about Rasmussen's study was that what he found was that people perceive that the accident boundary is actually in a different place than where it is. Usually maybe like a little bit closer in, but the other important fact here is that you don't really know where the accident boundary is until you cross it. So it's only through hindsight and having crossed the boundary do you actually know where the accident is. Um, and so that kind of really exposes us um, to a lot of potential for you know, all kinds of, um, you know, failure modes, uh, security breaches, um, vulnerability exploits. And so this, yeah, I think this neatly kind of, kind of shows how we need to kind of be uh, conscious of, uh, of what we're doing internally in terms of our culture. And this is my last one around like actual mental models and models that help us think. So this is um, a, a model done by Stephen Shorick and it's called The Varieties of Human Work. Um, I've linked the article, it's really fascinating and just really opened my mind quite a lot when I, when I read it as well a couple of years ago. So I guess uh, the way to describe this is there's kind of different varieties. These are the four key ones that he talks about, but there's kind of the work is imagined. So like, what do we imagine that work to look like mentally in our heads? 
Um, could also be somebody that's not specifically doing the task or somebody who's a bit further away, like a manager, like they might have expectations about how something's being done. There's the work that's prescribed. Um, this could come from a manager, but I think a good way to think about this as well in kind of the context of the security domain is that we have a lot of compliance and policy that we then, which is usually horribly written and it, usually in a not very technical way, which we then have to try and translate into actual technical requirements and outcomes. Uh, which is always quite interesting, especially when it's sort of legislative as well. There's the work that's done, so the actual practitioner that did the work, like how was that actually done? And then there's work that's disclosed. So like what does the practitioner disclose in terms of what they've done, like documentation, reports that they that they share verbally in a meeting, diagrams that they make, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see, there's there's normally like a small amount of overlap, but there's a lot, there's a lot here that, that doesn't overlap at all in terms of um, how we align our mental models uh, of, of the way that the work is done. Anyway, it's a bit theoretical, but go away and read that. It's really fascinating. So let's talk about getting started with um, security um, chaos engineering. So I've got the normal sort of chaos engineering lifecycle over here. It's not that different. <laughs> You'll be happy to hear, like super, super easy to kind of get started with security chaos engineering. And so it's always starting in the same place. You're defining the system steady state. The key difference maybe here is that you want to identify a security or compliance control that you want to validate or a set of controls. I would say start simple first, start manual first as well. So like probably one control, do it manually, see what happens. Um, I mean, there are some great tools and frameworks out there for injecting a failure, but I think the best place to start is to try and just do that manually. Um, then you want to design and run your experiment based on the controls that you've set, the security controls that you've set. Obviously, validate the hypothesis, see, see what the outcomes are, um, review your system state. What, under these new conditions, what is the system state? You want to capture your learnings, and then you need to remediate to actually get back to the steady state. Um, I don't know if there's a yes. So this is a key one as well. If you want to run it in the future, like if you think it's an actual useful um, test to run, then yeah, like look to automate that um, and build it into your pipelines. Um, I think uh, a really cool thing that kind of would be a nice next step that you know often a lot of companies don't get to is actually doing these things on a repeatable continuous basis, like actually building that into the CI CD process. We haven't quite got there either, just FYI. And I've been doing this for, for a long time. One day. Um, so where, where can you start? Like what, uh, and again, so if some of you are security, um, in the, the domain of security, you will probably already know this well, but for those that are not, like here's a, here's a good place to start, right? The OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities, um, they're a group um, really sort of uh, distributed global group, um, thousands of contributors that come together to kind of identify what are the top security risks uh, within the web and application domain, uh, security domains. So these are the top 10 that they have. Um, they haven't done an update since 2017, which is actually quite a long time for them. So it's like any, kind of any day now, they'll do another one. Um, but this is what they kind of identified then. It probably hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, I'm not gonna talk through each one of these, Maybe you want to screenshot it, <laughs> but it's kind of here as, as a list. And I kind of went through and thought about, okay, well, given the vulnerability, what kind of mitigations might you be able to do um, in order to, to try and uh, kind of mitigate that, not so that, so that it's no longer exploitable. Um, and yeah, there's, I mean, there's some common ones here that, that we see all the time. Injection still a big one, broken access control, I see that all the time now, especially as I'm working more in the infrastructure layers and responsible for that as well. Like it's, it's a big one and I think it's actually only going to become more important. Um, and yeah, the kind of other one I wanted to point out here was security misconfigurations. So there is actually like one specifically around the misconfigurations. Um, it's probably one of the most trickiest of all, um, but kind of some of the mitigations here are kind of like looking at your kind of least privileged model so looking at how you set up, you know, your RBAC, IAM, um, how that integrates with other systems like Okta, 
um, authentication, authorization, uh, but also having other things like yeah, appropriate login policies and schemas and monitoring for those uh, misconfigurations. And isolation, like it's an important one, like if you can isolate systems so that the blast radius is, is less of a problem. Um, there are other vulnerabilities. Again, this is just this is actually from my work because again, it's a it's a DevSec company. Uh, we do yearly reports about this stuff. Um, we blog about it all the time. So I pulled this as, out as well. This is kind of like the top ten, but these are kind of the other main vulnerabilities that you will see. And the reason why I'm throwing these up here, just by the way, is just to kind of get you thinking about okay, how would that apply internally in, in the context of my company, and what kind of hypotheses can I write based on these kind of um, top, top vulnerabilities so you can actually get started with this. And here's one of my favorite ones as well. Like we use, where I work, we use Kubernetes, of course. I mean, the ubiquity of it is, is every, you know, is everywhere. Um, many companies are using this now. Um, and so I did, again, like being from more of the infrastructure side, I really kind of identified with this. Um, there's two here that I kind of wanted to specifically talk about, which was like the initial access, like actually gaining like the, the access to the system through, like it says here, cloud credentials, compromised images and registry, uh, application vulnerabilities, exposed dashboards. I mean, again, I've seen a lot of these, these vulnerabilities be exploitable. Um, in some cases, um, engineers within my own company will for fun, um, do these things in their evening and see what's exploitable essentially and kind of say, hey, I found this uh, remote code execution or hey, I was able to get hold of this, um, these sets of credentials and now I've basically got root on your cluster so it's game over. Um, and the other one is the lateral movement, which is a big one. Like, you know, once I'm inside the system, can I actually gain access to lots of other parts of the system once I'm there? Um, and again, really important for thinking about this blog this blog post by the way from Microsoft is really great it's a really great way of thinking about okay these are real things <laughs> how could I write a hypothesis against these things given the kind of systems that I'm running where I work so I just wanted to quickly show you as well like what we did at um, my company sneak so we have run quite a few game days now we try to do them every two weeks now. Um, and the way that we do them is that for every on-call rotation, we'll try and spit, we'll try and do at least one um, game day. Um, and this was some of the things that we, we, we also, through our kind of, um, uh, uh, it's called Notion, so our internal kind of uh, knowledge sharing system, we kind of outlined, okay, what, what are some potential outage ideas? This isn't the full list, this is just kind of the top. Um, so these are kind of specific outage ideas, um, but then we also came up with some, again, some more security attack ideas specifically. And this was kind of just a brain dump. And then we actually went through to actually running a couple of specifically security chaos engineering game days that weren't just general chaos engineering day, game days. And yes, I did set up a, a Slack channel called Resilience Engineering, um, which we often share resources there. Really interesting. Um, and one of the ways uh, that I'll talk about a hypothesis here in a second. Yeah, so let's talk about game day exercises and I'll show you one of the actual hypotheses that we, that we actually wrote up and played out during a game day, a recent game day. So first thing I just want to talk about is the, uh, a way of getting started as well, which is um, this concept of capture the flag, um, which is a way, it's a really nice way of kind of gamifying learning about say, uh, security um, security engineering techniques, um, but also doing it in a way that you can kind of join up in different teams or different players and, and learn at the same time. Uh, again, this is like quite a good way of thinking about, okay, well, how would I, how can I learn, but also how can I mitigate this type of um, security uh, or compliance control? And so this is one that Facebook released um, which uh, is on GitHub, and it is, I think, I believe it's called Capture the Flag, um, and it's an interactive game. So I would say, if you're getting started with this kind of domain, like, this is a great place to start. It'll teach you a lot, but also you'll kind of get a feel for, like, how you might want to run a game day. And here you can see, like, an actual, um, a, an actual flag that they want them to capture, basically. So go after this company, uh, country, uh, this is uh, talking about RSA public key. 
so this was, uh, so anyway, capture the flag, great. Um, there's also one called remediate the flag. So look it up on GitHub as well, which uh, is probably more closely aligned with like how you like running some chaos engineering um, experiments. So I want to talk about a hypothesis um, that we actually ran recently. Um, and this was taken from the fact that we, what we tend to do in a lot of our chaos days is that we do something called theory crafting. And I'll come on to that a little bit later as well, which is where we kind of write down a scenario as played out by different actors in the system um, and kind of saying, okay, well, this happens, then this happens, and then this event happens, and then this happened. And so kind of just writing that down and having people playing different roles. Um, but we, we found this one as well. Um, a great way to think about hypothesis writing as well is to look at, like a good place to get started is to look at past incidents that you've had. Specifically, again, talking about security ones, like have you had a, a vulnerability exploit, a breach of some sort. If you take really good post-incident analysis reports and kind of do, do a really good job of that, you should be able to go back and identify, okay, what, what actually happened here? what of these uh, different outcomes can we actually turn into a hypothesis that we can then test for in our systems. So in this one, we um, said, okay, credentials tokens are actually accidentally committed to GitHub. I'm sure nobody here has ever done that before. <laughs> uh, I suspect a lot of people have. Um, uh, we, so the kind of hypothesis is that we can A, immediately rotate those, those credentials, B, we can do that without breaking the build, so we can get it deployed up as fast as possible. And that it, C, it will trigger an alert to the AppSec team. And so you can see here as like credentials are leaked, the security violation is detected, the alert is sent to the AppSec team, they're revoked, tokens are rotated, and then changes pushed to master and the build passes. So we get that up to production as fast as we can. Um, of course, when we ran this experiment, um, we already suspected there were gaps here, right? So this is the hypothesis. What we found is that parts of it failed. Um, a specific part of it that it failed was around this, this step here, around the security violation detected. We didn't, we don't really have enough monitoring set up around these kind of, um, these kind of security uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so like, again, like another great outcome of running these kind of chaos uh, experiments is finding gaps, all types of gaps. It's not just about coming up with an action item list of like technical actions that you can go away with, but you know, uh, a big part of security is around observability as well. So like, what are we monitoring for? What can we log? Um, you know, you might have a, 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 C, a seam, a SOC system as well that you want to feed things into. How can we automatically alert on things? Um, where are our dashboards? Uh, did we make enough investment in run books? All sorts of really great outcomes um, through doing this sort of stuff where you can find your gaps. Also following an incident response um, management kind of life cycle as well. Like, are we actually doing this appropriately? Does our incident, is our response appropriate? Did we actually follow it? Um, so again, lots of great outcomes to think about, not just purely kind of technical things that went wrong. Um, and just kind of taking it a step further, which is, um, it's all very well kind of hindsight, looking back at what we've done before, seeing things that have happened, could have gone better. Let's create a hypothesis around it. Um, I mean, it does help you create a, an amount of robust kind of observability and monitoring and, you know, finding failures early, but I also like the idea of trying to take it a step further and saying, what, what if we could codify our controls and policies in a way that we could randomize those failure conditions? Um, because I think that um, uh, what's normal, you know, what's normal is that these things are usually surprising to us and they're surprising because we didn't expect things to fail in the way that they did or for us to be exploited in the way that we were for that breach to happen in the way that it did. And so that's why I think like it's, it's kind of nice to, as in, in terms of a maturity stage is to get past kind of looking back and um, looking forward and saying, okay, how could we create a set of, of um, hypotheses where we could just randomize um, our controls and see what happens? Because that's actually what happens in real life. And so here it's just, again, just bringing this back up on screen around um, 
you know, just the messy reality is like, what would happen if, you know, something happened to the service, the service, you know, that cash, what's the impact of doing something like that? So you could take several um, compliance or security controls and say, hey, let's lay that over the top of this and see what that happens. Because it usually is a cascade of, of different things going, going wrong. And that's the other thing is trying to get past the simple and the past to something that's more complex and sort of uh, future facing as well. So this is, I'm getting right to, towards the end of here. Um, so this is um, just kind of some takeaways around, okay, great. Understood like how to kind of get started with um, security chaos uh, engineering, kind of understanding like what are the type of um, attack vectors, vulnerabilities that you might want to consider uh, when you're actually defining those hypotheses and running your experiments. But again, taking it like a step further, like it's it's great to do that, but you kind of want to build in kind of a DevSecOps culture within your company. Because a lot of this, again, like I would repeat, is around uh, building really strong bridges within the company, um, partnering, um, collaborating with other functions, which are sometimes siloed. Um, and, you know, it's all about the result of the customer. Like we're trying to mitigate and minimize impact customers. And that can, you know, be all types of things, but specifically around security and compliance, it's, it's trying to, again, mitigate or minimize the blast radius around things like, like we talked about earlier, like um, personally identifiable information being leaked in, in data breaches. So uh, last one here is, which is kind of re recall this from earlier, what else can we test for? Um, in our game days, I did mention earlier around um, a great place to start with this is not going in and actually breaking stuff. And I know how fun that is. Like it is really fun to go and break stuff. Um, uh, but you kind of want to do that in a controlled way, right? You, it's, yeah, you, you need to do that in a more controlled way, which is why we kind of say follow this life cycle. But even a step before that, I would say is like, it's not natural just to do these things immediately. Um, and what I've tended to do before is bring groups of uh, individuals together across a whole variety of, of the organization, which would normally be involved in, in a normal incident um, and say, okay, let's, let's just play out a couple of scenarios. Again, that theory crafting I was talking about earlier, kind of almost like a script that's written a couple of the actors that are there in that meeting have that information. And then you try to just play it out, play it out without actually touching any systems or breaking anything. And just seeing like, can we follow our incident response um, life cycle uh, appropriately? Um, what are people's first thoughts when they're trying to do this? Um, where do they look? Where would they look? Um, do, we, I, do we foresee that there are any gaps? Um, is there any kind of breakdown in communications as well? So there's lots of different roles that people can play during an incident. Um, so think about that, yeah, and uh, capture things like, do we have, like I mentioned before, runbook gaps, um, documentation gaps, monitoring, observability gaps. Um, can we follow a process? That's a, that's a big one, actually. Um, do people seem to panic in the moment? How can we actually get them more used to, to, to dealing with these situations that are really high pressure um, without panicking? And I think that's again, like plays into why I say like, if you're going to get started with this, try to do it on a more continual basis. And that's why we try to do a, a game day at least every two weeks. Um, and the great thing about doing that with our on-call rotation is that it's a different set of people every single time. Um, and you get to kind of play out a scenario. Um, and we actually have a dedicated um, cluster, a dedicated environment for, for running those experiments so that we can get back to the, to the um, steady state easily enough. And that's really, I think, it for me. Yeah, so thank you very much.